Welcome, everybody. Uh, first thing I need to tell you, um, both those of you who are here in the room and those who are on Zoom, that we are recording this. So I want to let you know that. Um, you're also going to notice that we're going to talk really loud. Um, make sure the microphone picks us up um, because of the noise the projector makes. Uh, when we get to the Q&A, which will hopefully uh, take up most of our time, we will probably have to repeat your question so that the folks at home uh, or wherever they are uh, on Zoom um, uh, can hear the question and then our responses to it. And I do want to thank everyone that is attending via Zoom. I think at last check, we had 75 folks. So we've got really good turnout for this. Uh, everybody is here voluntarily. <laughs> right? <laughs> good, good. That's what I love about our students. <laughs> My plea that I really, really, how many reallys did I put in that email? Four really uh, has paid off. So thanks to all of you for being here in person and remote. Um, this is Ethics Week in the School of Business Administration here at Gonzaga. It's something we do uh, every fall. Um, I want to thank Dean Anderson for supporting Ethics Week uh, all these years. Uh, I haven't checked thoroughly, but I would be surprised if there's any other school of business in the US that devotes a whole week to ethics. <laughs> uh, a lot of schools do ethics moments. You know, like, all right, we're gonna take 30 seconds and we're gonna talk about ethics or something like that. But being a Jesuit school of business, uh, having a whole week devoted to ethics um, is befitting uh, of our tradition. So I wanna thank Dean Anderson for supporting all the work there. Help us pull this off. All right, so this is our last event for Ethics Week. Um, and you know the, the basic topic uh, for the panel. What we wanted to do today is talk a little bit about the role of uh, giving back to one's community uh, via one's professional life or via the opportunities that one's professional life provides you. Um, there is a distinctive um, Jesuit tradition of business education. A lot of you, if not all of you, have been introduced to that now. And a key element of that tradition is the notion and the aspiration of business leaders thinking about their work as a noble vocation. Noble vocation. Maybe one of the few times you'll ever see the word noble used in reference or in the context of business leadership. But it's a beautiful phrase. It's a beautiful idea. And here at Gonzaga School of Business, as you again all know, we promote that idea as heavily as we can. And what this tradition means, what the Jesuits mean by thinking about business leadership as a noble vocation, is that it's part charism, it's the use of those talents or gifts or aptitudes or skills that you have as a calling in the service of the common good. So that's what this idea of noble vocation is about. And giving back to one's community, um, perhaps making use of those particular professional charisms that you have gifts, talents, aptitudes, is part of helping to serve the common good. So that's our topic for today. Um, we're very lucky to have assembled this panel. Um, this is a group of individuals who are steeped in the Gonzaga tradition, steeped in this idea of not only thinking about business leadership as a noble vocation, but thinking about one's career in whatever field or area it might be as a noble vocation. So I'm just gonna do some quick introductions and then I'm just gonna sort of turn it over. Maybe we'll start with Kevin to talk a little bit about how their experience in this Jesuit Gonzaga tradition has influenced how they have thought about and engaged in activities giving back to the community in various ways. And then after we kind of go through that, we'll start fielding some questions, all right? So Mr. Kevin McQuilkin, uh, a GU alum, uh, bachelor's degree honors in accounting and finance, right? Correct. Correct. Uh, a long and distinguished career, uh, mainly in mergers and acquisitions um, with uh, JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank, and then most recently Wells Fargo, correct? Uh, he's now retired. Uh, so, formerly of New Canaan, Connecticut, now Spokane, Washington also has a long and distinguished career, uh, an ongoing career on our board of trustees. So Kevin McQuilkin. 
Uh, to my right, Professor Adrian Lighthouser, uh, also a three-time alum, right? Uh, three degrees, uh, an undergrad in philosophy, a master's in philosophy, and also an MBA. Um, Professor Lighthouser is in, it's not a department, it's not a discipline unto itself, but is the better half of the business ethics department here in the School of Business. Um, has a long history, not just with GU as a student, but also connecting GU up with the larger community. It's a very civic organization, very activist, uh, several activist organizations. So she has lots and lots of examples and experience of taking her professional life and using that to give back to the local and regional community. So, Professor Adrian Lighthouse. Uh, Dr. Dane McCullough. Bag University president, also an alum. As it turns out, I'm the only non-alum <laughs> in this panel. Um, again, a long history, not just as a student, but also in leadership for basically three decades and change of leadership um, here at Gonzaga. Um, various roles, has been our president now. This is 11th year, right? It started your 12th, 13th. Started your 13th, right, I was off. Um, has been very active, as all of you know, and not just um, leading efforts of members of the GU community and giving back to the community, reaching out, but leading the university itself as a collective body um, and contributing to and helping to empower the uh, common good of the local community. So, I'm Brian Stevenson, right? Uh, I teach uh, business ethics in the School of Business. Uh, I'm in my 30th year. I don't have a degree from Gonzaga. I probably should get one. I should do the MBA. There you go. Why not? I got time to do that. But um, um, the 30 years that I have spent here um, have made me who I am personally and professionally, without a doubt. And part of that is to recognize the different ways in which I can also take the rather limited set of professional skills that I have but nonetheless use them to help to enrich um, the well-being and the common good of various populations here in Spokane and in the Northwest. So, welcome to all of you. Oh, okay. okay, okay. Again, thanks to all of you for being here. We're going to take some time and go through the panel and make some comments, um, uh, some advice about how to do this, how to make use of your parisms, uh, the various things you have, in pursuit of your future business lives and careers or whatever career or field you go into as a noble vocation. And then we'll do some Q&A. Does that sound all right? All right, Kevin, do you mind kicking us off? Sure. Um, I'll tell two stories. Speak up as loud as Two stories, um, one of which relates to being involved here. Um, roughly 15 years ago, uh, Bob Spitzer, Father Bob Spitzer, former president, came to New York. Uh, I got a call from his assistant, said he's going to be there. Could you have lunch? I said, sure. I've never met him. Uh, I frankly wasn't that involved other than sending a periodic check to Gonzaga since I graduated in the early 80s. And um, Father Spitzer, those of you that know him, he doesn't tend to beat around the bush much. Uh, literally five minutes after we sat down, uh, he said, so we have this board seat, and I want you to be on it. My response, the immediate response was, how much is that going to cost me? <laughs> and he's a sharp guy. He said, not that much yet. So we talked a bit about what it meant, uh, what the board was about, how did it work. Uh, I said, let me think about it. And a couple of days later, I called him and um, I said, so here's what I'm thinking. There's lots of nonprofit boards. I've been on a few. My experience is most of them are about ceremony. I said, I don't have time for ceremony. But if you're telling me there's real work to do that I can do, uh, sign me up. And 15 years later, I'm still doing it. And there's a lot of work to do. <laughs> um, and it's great fun. It's, it's the, the key is to be able to use your skills and expertise it may be business related um, to benefit an organization. Uh, 
we've had a lot of discussions with some of my colleagues about uh, things like volunteering, and just as an example in a supervisor. I can do that. I'm a lot better at making money and helping businesses grow and organizations grow than I am at laying out suit. I just am. So maybe that's a better use of my time. The point being, figure out where you can add value and where you may be able to add more value than somebody else and do that. Um, the other story is more about my wife, frankly. Um, <clears throat> about 15 years ago, she started a hockey program, ice hockey program in Connecticut for kids with developmental disabilities, autism, Down syndrome, things like that. Started with six kids. She had no idea what she was doing at all. And today it's still going 15 years later and they have 60 young adults and kids. And it is by far the greatest thing I've ever been involved with. Um, she runs it, she's got a board. Um, I help when I can, I carry bags. I'm the team Sherpa, but since I'm the only one, I named myself Head Sherpa. <laughs> um, but one of the things we did with that program was when our well, eldest son came here, more than 10 years ago. Um, we were put in touch with a professor in the School of Ed studying autism. So we funded the beginnings of a program that still goes today um, for special needs kids and they're studying autism. They're doing a formal study of how does ice hockey work with autism. So to me, it was a combination of her passion. Um, we had the financial capacity to help and we had an idea and our son got the hockey team here involved. And um, it just, it's about figuring out where your skills meet the needs is really what it comes down to. Great, thank you. I, I also, as you can tell from the screen behind me and I failed to mention this, uh, Ms. McQuilkin is our first uh, executive in residence in the School of Business. And I think part of that role is for us to take advantage of particular skills and talents and experience you have to benefit the common good of our students as well. So we wanted to thank you for that. Professor Whitehouse. So um, I was born and raised in Spokane. Uh, and as many people who were born and raised in Spokane couldn't wait to leave, that was my plan was to get out and, and never come back basically. Um, uh, but I was raised uh, by a couple of old hippies uh, where we were having social justice conversations around the table. And when my, um, when the situation changed with the university I was at and I had to come back to Spokane, um, I kind of, to be honest, stumbled into Gonzaga and then clearly have never left. Mm -hmm. uh, I found a, really an alignment with, with the values that I have um, and the concern for injustice uh, and how we can remedy those things. Um, and as a result of that, I've had incredible opportunities to give back. And instead of being one of those folks who left Spokane and never looked back, actually work to make it a better place. Um, and it's a considerably, not just by my uh, work clearly, but it's a considerably um, improved and more welcoming community uh, over the last 20 years. And I'm glad to have been a small part of it. Uh, and I think that that sort of matches what, what Kevin was talking about. I really liked the comment about um, finding a, a board where you can apply your skills and talents. And I think um, that's one of the important things for you at any point when you're thinking about engaging to be reflecting on. Um, I used to serve in the MBA office um, as one of the advisors. And I would often talk to students who had little work experience um, about thinking about volunteer opportunities, but thinking about how they can pro provide services that match the skills they've been developing. Uh, because nonprofits are big businesses, but often struggle to fill roles that are around finances, that are around effective marketing, that are around social media presence, that are around telling their story, it's just difficult to fill those roles. And it's such a unique opportunity for um, uh, students to be able to actually apply those skills 
uh, that they've been learning along the way and learn about those kinds of opportunities for, for different organizations. One of the things that, that I found that I became really passionate about in Spokane uh, is tied around affordable housing. Oh, are we using microphones? Now? Yeah. Okay. It's on. Should be. Okay. So uh, affordable housing became a, a, a passion of mine. And uh, because of my role in higher education, uh, I had the privilege of being invited to join the Citizen Advisory Board for the City of Spokane's Community Housing and Human Services Board and Affordable Housing Committee. And I'm now chair of both of those. And our responsibility as the Citizen Advisory Board, uh, this is where I get to use my NBA too, is, is to uh, vet projects uh, for the city around those services and affordable housing. And we're directing millions and millions of, do of dollars annually, uh, national dollars, state dollars, and local dollars. Uh, and I wouldn't have had the opportunity to learn about that or be in a position where my perspective was sought after <laughs> without these experiences that I've had here at Gonzaga. Uh, so I would just say, recommend, start now. Start now thinking about how you can use the skills you're learning and further develop them to offer those services. And if it starts now, it becomes a natural part of your professional life. It's not something that you add on when you have time. You can start small, um, but it becomes really how you approach your professional life. It's part of that professional life. Wow. Good afternoon, good evening, almost, or like right after lunch. Um, <laughs> I think I'd like to speak more specifically out of the context of serving as the university's president. So when I became president, uh, which was itself a very unexpected event for a Gonzaga grad who uh, never really aspired to be a Jesuit, Father Spitzer was a Jesuit. I just got a message from Father Spitzer on the phone. Um, I, uh, it was a close boat. Uh, yeah, I, heard. <laughs> I uh, did a little bit of uh, research on what it means to be a president. And I learned that a big piece of doing the job was to do work that I had never done before. And that was specifically to start relating to constituencies outside the university. Because my whole life at Gonzaga, had been focused inside. So when I started working at Gonzaga, I worked in student life. I was working with the residence hall staff. I did a lot of work with students. Um, I worked in a number of departments that they were all focused on student support or I was teaching because I was a member and am a member of the psychology department. But no one outside the university, other than those people who we were friends with, knew who I was. And they didn't understand why the board decided to choose me to do this job. When I went out to the Spokane community, what I discovered was a huge gap that existed in the minds of the business community and civic leadership between what they perceived Gonzaga to be and how I perceived Gonzaga to be. So remembering that I had been immersed for almost 20 years inside the university and I was very aware of the kinds of things that many of our faculty and our staff and our students were doing that rendered real service, real contributions to the, to the community. I was appalled at what I heard from the business leaders. They're like, well, we generally think Gonzaga is a pretty cool place, but we don't really know much about what, the, what it does. And we really don't understand if it even cares about Spokane. So I'm like, wait a second, hold on. Because what I also knew at the same time, I was quickly picking up on 
as I became president, I got a whole bunch of greeting messages from different people in the community. The mayor, you know, hey, congratulations, how you doing, how you doing? The, the school district superintendent for District 81 reached out, said, can we have lunch? I said, sure, you know, absolutely. We can do lunch. So we got together and just as one example, that individual asked me if I would be willing to maintain the university's commitment to the tremendous amount of hours that students were providing to the school district in terms of mentoring programs to students. As it turned out, we had been doing that for so long that the school district was actually dependent upon these programs to succeed when they were looking at the comprehensive nature of the education they were providing. They were dependent upon the debt. So what I came away from was an experience of recognizing that Gonzaga students in particular, but also faculty and staff were very heavily involved with the welfare of the community. We were not doing a good job of talking about that. And the reason that it was important to talk about that is because the more awareness there was in the community of our investment in the community as an organization, the more interested and willing members of the business community would be in investing in us. And the real takeaway from all of that is, is that we're all part of a symbiotic ecosystem. Not everybody in that ecosystem is capable of doing the same kinds of things, but it takes everybody in that ecosystem to actually make it work effectively. And so all from the beginning of that experience through my time as president, I have tried to figure out ways that actually are interconnected with the educational experience that we're trying to create and provide that also benefit the community. When Dr. Steverson and I were talking about me coming to be part of this panel, he suggested that I give as an example our effort to try to create a space where within this community, more people could have access to the COVID-19 vaccines last spring. So something that you need to know is that at the inception of the availability of the vaccines, there is actually a large amount of vaccine coming out of production facilities. It was being throttled already through the supply chain. But when it got to the providers, the biggest challenge the providers had was that they were being required by the state to do things like maintaining social distancing and PPE usage and making sure that the areas were being constantly and continuously clean. And most of the providers that were licensed and capable of providing the vaccine did not have venues that would actually meet the requirements for things like social distancing and PPE. Luckily, no one was able to use any of our fitness facilities at the time, including the field house. So he said, hey, uh, hello, over here, we have a field house. And you know what, Chaz, which is a local nonprofit provider of medical services to the community and is specifically committed to making sure that everyone has access to medical care, regardless of income level, they said, we will partner with you. And as a result, over 8,000 people in this community got access to the coronavirus vaccines in February. Most of those people would have had to wait at least two months. And it was simply about finding a solution that really was all about space. As a result, Gonzaga got a lot of press. Gonzaga was viewed as contributing to the um, solution building around access to vaccines in, in our community. And the side benefit of that is a lot more of our own community members actually got access to the vaccines. 
We weren't assured that members of our community would have access to that. That wasn't the point. I believe that if we were willing to make that kind of commitment, which took a lot of volunteer hours on the part of students, our nursing students, and other students as well as staff and faculty, we might have a shot at actually being designated as a point of distribution for the vaccine ourselves. And sure enough, in May we were, but only because we put a stake out there and we said we want to be part of creating the solution. You have to remember at this time, availability of vaccines was a huge issue, but already the question of whether or not there was going to be these divides around whether or not people should be or not be getting vaccinated were starting to emerge. So it became almost viewed by some people as some kind of a political positional statement. And our view was, look, we're just trying to make this available to those who want it. Um, I share this because I also want to say that inside that major effort, there were a lot of people who found the ability to express their passion and because of their unique skills and qualifications, they were able to actually express out of their profession a willingness to be generous. Um, and that was incredibly intrinsically rewarding. We had nursing students who had never before given anyone a vaccination. And the first vaccine they ever gave to another human being as a nursing student at Gonzaga was the COVID-19 vaccine. That was an incredibly powerful experience for those nursing students. They hadn't been able to access a clinical setting at all for almost a year. We had other people who were in charge of logistics, other people who were in charge of IT. All these people finally found a way to be generous and to be giving back to the community through this very unique experience. That was incredibly rewarding. But I just wanna make one other observation because I started with the schools. One thing that I always try to share whenever I get the chance to do so. And I want you to understand this is not blowing smoke. You have no idea as college students, how super cool you are. I've been telling them that all semester. Oh, okay. Then I'm on the same page. And we did not share our notes. Little people in this community look up to you like you would not believe. They will not listen to their parents. I have three <laughs> who are no longer little people. They haven't listened to me for years. They will listen to you even today. And so know that you can have an impact even for 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes on a, on a little person, on a younger person, because they're still in the process of trying to figure out where am I supposed to be? How do I go there? What do I do? And so if you can find a synergy between something that you found as a passion, whether it's within the school of business or something related to your work at GU, and an opportunity to share that, it's magic. It has a tremendous impact. That's what the district superintendent had realized together with all those two teachers. The students were looking at the teacher saying, yeah, you're supposed to do this. They're looking at the college students saying, I might be you one day. That's incredibly powerful. So it's, it's rewarding, I think, for those who are involved with the work. But I think it's also really important, never underestimate the impact that you can be having on somebody else, just merely through your presence, by paying attention, much less some lesson you might teach them. That's great. Um, not only don't underestimate um, the impact that you have, don't underestimate the opportunities that you have, but don't underestimate yourself. And this relates to um, um, a little bit of my story that I wanted to tell you. Um, so I'm a business ethicist, right? I'm, I'm trained to be an applied ethicist. And you might think, well, 
what are you going to do? What particular skills do you have uh, as an applied ethicist? I can't do Excel, right? People send me Excel files and ask me to do something to them. I'm like, that's not going to happen. Um, finance, buy me, right? Um, the intricacies of local and municipal bureaucracies and, and um, knowledge about the lay of the land out there in terms of some of our underserved communities. Um, Professor Lighthouser knows that to a T, knows every bit of that. I don't have that. So what is it that I could give back? What particular care is? And here's what I discovered um, many, many moons ago, because um, I've been uh, doing this now, teaching for 34 plus years. I realize this, and I don't know if it's a skill or a talent. It certainly isn't something that um, I learn along the way, as I might learn, you know, uh, Kantian moral philosophy or something like that. But I discovered that I do have a talent for initiating and creating an environment in which people are willing to talk about ethical issues, creating a space and providing assistance for them to work through ethical issues that they're confronting in their work life and their professional life. And I discovered that I'm kind of good at that. I can do that. Um, who knows why? Um, I give each year, I probably do about five to six uh, professional ethics presentations. I did one yesterday uh, to the um, um, uh, Spokane Fraud Conference. It's an annual conference at the local chapter of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners puts on every year, um, and so I, I talk with them. Uh, last year, I talked with them about psychopaths. I don't, I didn't, that didn't come out right, I pointed at you. <laughs> I, I didn't edit that, okay, edit that. Um, uh, uh, Dr. McCullough has his PhD in psychology, so we, we've talked about this. Organizational psychopaths. Um, uh, we talked, uh, yesterday I talked to them about uh, fraud in times of crisis, right? Uh, like fraud with the PPP loans, CARES Act, and so forth. Um, so I give a number of these. What I've discovered is that for whatever reason, I have the ability to do this. And it seems to work, right? I'll leave it up to my students to judge how well it works in the classroom. Good, good, right? I got two thumbs up. That's a great day. So the point of this is to um, challenge you to look for it, right? Um, the Jesuits talk about finding good in all things. And they don't mean by that just kind of wandering around and hopefully you'll stumble upon the good or you'll stumble upon the opportunity um, uh, to help to promote the good, be involved in the good. They're actually asking and directing us to be active about that. Seek out those opportunities and seek out those parts of yourself, whatever they may be that puts you in a position to be able to contribute to, even if it's just children, right? Or, or um, working at a vaccine clinic. We worked at the clinic. It was a powerful experience. I got to tell you, it really was. People were so grateful uh, in the conversations we had uh, with them as they were lining up and preparing, as they were leaving. Um, they were so thankful that we were there. They were so thankful that Gonzaga had done this. So. Engage in some self-reflection, right? Because you have to understand, because you perhaps don't think about it enough, what am I good at? What particular kind of skill or talent or character trait do I have that can be, if I look for actively, those opportunities to put in play to help serve the common good, even if it's in a small scale way? Because sometimes we think about big things, right? And that's how we're going to sort of participate in and help to serve the common good. But sometimes it happens in a very localized way. It can happen sometimes just between you and one other person. That can count as serving uh, the common good and enacting the work that you do as a noble vocation. So my advice to you is be in a kind of constant, not overwhelming, but a constant state of self-reflection. What is it I can do? And where can I actively find opportunities to make use of that? Okay, so I think we'll turn it over to some questions now, if you have some.
Um, there's a wealth of advice up here and you can tap into it for free. So fire away and I'll repeat your question and then pass the microphone on. Because I will call on people. <laughs> and AJ, you, if you have any in the chat, you'll let us know. Great. <laughs> Can we tell you? Oh, you have one. God, leave that small friend. <laughs> uh, are there ways that these outreach activities make you better in your day-to-day -day work? Do you have any examples of lessons or skills you have learned from your outreach? So, for sure, um, it is. I think it, every opportunity helps you to be more reflective um, and helps you better understand the community that you're a part of. Uh, but also quite specifically, um, before I was working with the city, uh, I was pretty heavily involved with the Spokane Alliance, um, which is a nonpartisan community organization composed of, um, actually started in, in the 60s, Industrial Areas Foundation, um, and it was around civil rights uh, where folks realized that, that the churches were working on this, the unions were working on this, and other community organizations were working on this, just not together. Uh, so this, it brings all three sectors together um, and gives you a, a, an opportunity to really learn more holistically about, about the community and from each other and from people you wouldn't necessarily normally be interacting with. Um, but I would say one of the things um, that it particularly uh, helped me with, uh, the, the process for identifying um, an issue that we're going to take on in the community uh, and the process for working up to where we do an action on it uh, is incredibly Ignatian. It's uh, very, very similar to that process, and it, and, it, and it helped me think about that iterative process that involves the contents, context and the action, and then the reflection, and then you go back and you chew off another bite. Um, so we worked really hard. An example of, of something we pushed for was um, uh, paid sick and safe leave in Spokane. Um, and we were able to get local businesses to participate when nobody thought we would be able to get businesses to participate. Um, and, and that process, I was able to see that that process works and it's applicable in more places than just the classroom and how important it is to, to um, think about how you can apply that uh, to your life in, in other ways. And it was an exciting win because Pan passed it, and we got to have breakfast with the governor who put out a sick leave uh, policy. He figured if, if Spokane could do it, Washington State could do it. Uh, so we actually helped spearhead Washington State uh, having mandatory sick leave as well. Hmm. The question is some sort These of outreach stuff. activities. I mean, um, your day-to-day -day work and life that um, So I was an investment banker for 35 years. We tend to be very aggressive. Um, nobody's ever used the term noble and investment banker in the same sentence, <laughs> but I'm aware of it. Um, I talked earlier about the hockey program my wife and um, um, I learned how to appreciate People with challenges never had any experience and it was a real eye-opener not just the kids the parents they have real challenges too uh, patience beyond anybody should ever have to deal with but at the same time a real type a have to be aggressive for their kids to to get to the resources that are available and i was able to i, I learned a lot from them even the kids a lot um, and was able to, I think, become a better, certainly a better manager and leader in the firm by being more understanding. We didn't, bankers don't spend a lot of time with understanding. <laughs> it's just not a priority. But it's become a priority over the last decades uh, with younger generations. Uh, and it's not, it's not something I was ever good at. And we can debate whether I have achieved any progression on that. Um, but that was definitely something that I learned through that, that service. 
No question. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the room? Yes, far away. So the question is: Is there is there a job too small to either um, take on or pay attention to, or it be worthwhile? Uh, I would say no. And I'll give you an example recently for me, and then I'll pass the microphone on. Um, I think it was last Thursday. Is that when we went walking to class? So, yeah. so um, I got a sense last Thursday that um, my students needed to do something other than being in that room with me. I know, hard to imagine, but <laughs> they needed something different that day, right? It had kind of been building. So we covered a little bit, uh, tied up some loose ends for something we had to do in class. And then I gave them a brief synopsis of this essay by Henry David Thoreau called Walking, where he talks about what it means to really walk, to saunter. Um, and he talks about saunterers back in the day, we're headed towards the Holy Land, but he means that metaphorically, not a geographic location. So I cut my students loose and I invited them to go sauntering. Okay? Now, some sauntered to happy hour <laughs> at various locations. Perhaps that's what they needed, I don't know. But now getting, I did receive two emails from two students who told me that was exactly what they needed at that point in that day. Some things were going on and, and they just needed a space and a time where nobody was asking them to do anything except walk and reflect. So I don't think there is a job too small. Um, the key is to be perceptive enough to notice them, to sense when these small opportunities pop up for you to contribute to the well-being of someone else or a small group, because they, as you mentioned, they can fly under the radar, right? We tend to um, think in terms of large scale activities. So that would be an example I would give. I think in the sense of um, what we're able to contribute to because of where we're at professionally, um, that might not be the same for everyone. Uh, but one of the things that I always think about is uh, the importance of of formal and especially informal mentorship. Uh, and so most, most jobs, even if it is a job and not your vocation, if it's just a job, which sometimes that's, that's what it is, um, still provide you the opportunity to impact someone else uh, and, and give you those opportunities to, to, to give back, um, whether it be through advice, whether it be through care. Um, and, and those are important ways of giving back. Uh, and I would just also say that as you know, not every business person uh, considers that their vocation and maybe the meaning that someone finds isn't in their job, be it significant or insignificant, but it, it is in the service that they provide. So, so I think, although maybe some doors are open for sure, that wouldn't have been um, if, if uh, we were in other positions, uh, there are still big and small ways that, it, regardless of your of your profession or career or job, that you would be able to contribute. I'd say there there are some fundamental assumptions that um, it's very easy for people who uh, work at large scale to kind of fall into. And so from my perspective, one of the greatest challenges with the work and with the um, desire to try to impact that scale is that you can actually become very disconnected from the lived experience, even of the people that you're actually really trying to serve. And so from my perspective, I agree. I, I don't think there is 
there is an issue of scale or, or something that's too small to be significant. But sometimes it's the individual interaction that actually helps to remind you and to root you in what otherwise you become disconnected from. So this is kind of a found issue for me in my work is there's every semester, there's a couple of students who make a point of making an appointment just to chat. They just want to have an opportunity to connect and to talk and to kind of get to know me and for them to share out of their experience. And uh, often these are not one-offs. They become kind of a pattern over time. And that has been incredibly helpful and powerful for me too, because I can come into that situation making all kinds of assumptions about what it is that they're coming to say and be dead wrong. And for reasons I had no idea about. That's really helpful. That's actually, it often kind of sets me into a new space. So from my perspective, no, there's no, there's nothing too small. Often it's the other way around. Sometimes it can be too big. It's just real, real briefly. A lot of things may start real small. And you see the impact that that has. Figure out how to make it much bigger. Mm -hmm. Things grow, and you learn along the way. So try it. So a related question um, uh, in the chat: How can current students get involved in mentoring? Well, we have programs. <laughs> Uh, there's lots of programs for current students to, to be engaged in, in mentoring. And I think, um, so there are formal programs, um, which speaks to what Dr. McCullough was talking about with um, uh, reaching out and working with the kids in the community. Um, but I would also say coming up with affinity groups is one of the areas in which you do informal mentoring. Um, upperclassmen and and are able to mentor um, freshmen and sophomores uh, through some of those affinity group organizations. And, and we have those as, as the faculty as well, staff has those as well, where we've created learning communities where we have the opportunity to learn from each other. Um, so while there are formal ways that you can engage in, in mentorship, uh, there's also an abundance of informal ways in which you can, you can engage that way. Uh, and an example is faculty have a group that's called Productive Discomfort uh, that's focused on being willing. Maybe maybe students don't know this, but faculty get nervous about bringing up tough topics in the classroom and um, get worried about saying the wrong thing or causing harm or not knowing how to react to, depending on what, what gets discussed in the class. And productive discomfort is an opportunity for us to come together and, and learn from each other, uh, learn best practices, uh, help each other through when somebody has made a mistake and they wanna, they wanna talk over what happened, what went wrong, and, and we wanna work on, on getting better. Uh, and I just think in all spaces, you have the opportunity to create those affinity groups and, and engage in, in that kind of mentorship. Yeah, if I could just tag on, I would say, you know, we have organized um, departments like the Center for Community Engagement at, at Hemmingson that serves almost as a clearinghouse for all sorts of needs that exist in the community and is an outgrowth of a very long tradition of volunteerism and, and community engagement. Um, but my own experience has been that in the, in the Spokane community alone, the needs are far greater than there are people willing to help. Um, and so, you know, I, I recall from my own student days, I wanted to get involved in the community somehow. And my particular interest at that time was honestly with kids who um, had, had been introduced into the criminal justice system. And as a function, of what they had done or what they had been involved with, they were institutionalized. And so I volunteered at that at the facility um, and uh, it, was, it was extremely difficult work uh, because what 
these kids held in common was that at some point along the path of their growth and development, the trust that they ordinarily would have had in an adult had been broken. So they had very, very little trust in anyone uh, actually giving a crap about them and uh, felt like anyone who, who was interacting with them probably was there because they had to be there because somebody was paying them to be there. That's different than somebody who wanted to be there. And so they were desperate for volunteers because the intrinsic value of somebody who would actually show up just to be there was more powerful than people realized, but they had a hard time because it was difficult. It was difficult to have these kind of interactions. So I think the needs are tremendously great. Um, and yet, um, you know, on campus as well as off campus, um, I think there's huge opportunities. I would just add to that, um, be creative, you know, be innovative. That's one of the talents and skills. I'm always blown away by the creativity that my students have. Um, you folks are fabulous with that. So again, uh, as Professor Lighthouser mentioned, whether it's with affinity groups, creating one, right? Not just becoming involved in existing ones, think creatively about how you can do this, right? Um, that's part of what's behind the notion of practicing your um, career or your profession as a calling, right? It's not just to respond to, but it's to create as well. Not just opportunities, but ways and groupings in which you can um, uh, be a mentor or you can contribute to the common good in some uh, shape or fashion. So any questions in the room? We have another one on the chat I can ask. Okay. So the question is, is this, uh, in our careers, have we faced some ethical challenges as we try to live out this ideal of a noble vocation? As Kevin's laughing already, <laughs> so he's going to get the microphone first, um, and how we try to give back to the communities that we can serve. Kevin, um, <clears throat> the ethical challenge part is, is easy, uh, easy to identify. Um, bankers deal in information, most of which is highly confidential. Uh, we also make our living by helping clients do things to grow their companies. And sometimes that creates some very gray areas on what do you do with this confidential information. It happens every single day. Uh, and it's a challenge, always. Um, and you learn to deal with it. You learn to be open. You learn to be obviously concerned about it. Uh, but people, fall down. It just takes time and it takes experience. And one of the things I led a 20 years uh, would lead a, a section in the training program for the young bankers just come out of school. And we always talk about do the right thing. What does that mean? And the problem is that you don't always know what the right thing is. There's a lot of gray. And the message in those classes was always if it doesn't feel right, Raise your hand. Ask somebody. Always. Unfortunately, it doesn't always happen. I'll tell a little story. We had a uh, one training class at uh, <clears throat> one of the firms I worked with, and these were MBAs. They were they were not twenty two year olds. These were more mature in theory themselves, mm -hmm. and they had a final exam, a team project. And um, there, it was a real transaction and they were told, don't look at the real information, which somebody knew they could find. Only use what we made available, which wasn't the answer to the question. Um, one of them went into the closed deal file and basically got the answer to the test. And then circulated it essentially to everybody. And people figured it out, the people supervising this program. Um, they dug in their emails and they determined everybody had it. And as you can imagine, that's a pretty significant issue. 
Uh, there was a lot of discussion about firing all of them. Very blatant disregard for the rule. Um, and when I talked to the group, what I told them was the worst part is not the first one that went in and got the The real issue was, in my view, that not a single one of these people felt something was wrong enough to raise their hand. Not one. And I think if we're teaching people here to think ethically, that's what we need to learn. Is when is it time to raise your hand and say something's not right? You don't have to make a big public deal about it, but you should ask someone. Uh, and that was a real lesson. We didn't fire anybody. But everybody agreed with that. So a number of years ago, um, I served on the City of Spokane Ethics Commission. I think I did six years. Um, that makes it sound like a sentence that didn't come out right. <laughs> I was honored to be part of the City of Spokane uh, Ethics Commission for six years. And not our current mayor, but the previous mayor got brought up on um, charges or allegations of an ethics violation, the details of which are, are irrelevant. But I had to chair the hearing. Um, the way the process worked, there was um, enough reason to proceed to an ethics hearing. Um, not quite a trial, but it looks sort of like a trial to try to determine whether the mayor had indeed violated the city code of ethics. And there was a lot of emotion. There was a, a, a strong call and a lot of, it was a charged atmosphere. Um, a lot of people wanted the mayor convicted of that. Well, it's not really a conviction, but to be found in violation of the code of ethics, which, as you can imagine, um, for a mayor, that would be a serious um, charge to be found on. Uh, um, and I'll go ahead and say this. Even among some of my fellow commissioners, it was pretty clear they were focused on an outcome. They wanted this process to yield an outcome. The ethical challenge for me as the chair was to ensure due process. That's what I had to make sure happens in this area, right? Um, apart from the outcome. So I had to be very focused um, in sharing the session. Um, at times I had to act like a judge. I had to make determinations on motions and all this stuff way out of my um, depth. But nonetheless, I had to ensure that due process occurred um, apart from what that process yielded in terms of an outcome regarding the allegations. And it wasn't easy, but as Kevin mentioned, it was the right thing to do. And that was my ethical obligation as the chair of that commission in that hearing to make sure that due process happened. And it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy, um, not just in terms of managing it, but also making sure that my own bias at the surface didn't play a role in the proceedings. Um, the commission ended up finding that the mayor was not um, in violation of the Code of Ethics, as alleged. Um, afterwards, from some uh, former members of the commission and some other individuals, I did get a lot of grief for that. Um, someone told me, you're going to be known as the person that let the mayor off the hook. Um, and so there was this blowback. But nonetheless, in the face of all of that, I could respond by saying, all I did was ensure that due process occurred here. Um, and the outcome is not up to me. but that due process happened, that ethical obligation I had was up to me. So that was a challenging thing I had to do as part of um, a kind of community service as a volunteer member of the uh, Ethics Commission here in Spokane. Um, I really resonate with an observation that you and that is to say, um, often when we're introduced to ethics as a frame or concept. Um, the examples that are given are uh, ones that, um, at least at the point of entry, are, are reasonably easy issues to determine. But my experience is that um, the ethical conundra that many people in, in the work find themselves actually confronted with are not easy at all. Um, 
And so certainly the most prominent and most recent challenge that that is a you know publicly observable issue was the decision to reopen the university in the context of COVID. And um, to give a little bit of context, because this is a very, very complex and a, and a lot of detail here. You know, in the late spring of 2020, so already students had been sent home and were trying to finish their work online and faculty were trying to teach from online. And we were faced with the decision as to whether or not to try to reopen for the fall of 2020. And the reason we, we already were faced with that is because if we were to do that, we had a lot of planning to do. We were going to have to take this university that had been thrown up in the, in the air and come down and broke into a million pieces and try to put it all back together. And there were a lot of institutions up and down the West Coast that didn't even have the choice. Pretty much the whole state of California said you can't come back, not safe. A lot of institutions in the state of Washington, they made the same decision. They said, we're not coming back. Starting with Eastern Washington University, they said, we're not coming back. So Gonzaga is sitting out here and along with you know our colleagues up north a little bit at Whitworth, and we're like, you know what? Here's part of our problem, A, we don't know how we can deliver on the academic program if we're trying to do it entirely online because a lot of our academic programs require hands-on work. Engineers have to do senior design projects. A lot of that stuff is technical on hands-on. Biologists have to do and chemists have to do experiments. They're doing that in the lab. There's a reason that it becomes profoundly difficult for certain online institutions to help their students do the work entirely online because there is still a significant amount of work that requires technical uh, proficiency that can only be gained hands-on. So we were really sitting there going, how are we gonna do this, right? How are we gonna deliver on our mission commitment? How are we gonna help students complete? The other challenge of course is so much of who we are as institution is a residential undergraduate campus. Part of what we promise is the opportunity to live in community, all those kinds of things. So I framed up a paper and I circulated it to a faculty group. I said, this is what I think. And immediately the response was, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? And by the way, in the popular press that summer, there's a whole raft of articles pointed directly at university presidents saying, if you bring students back, you are going to kill people and you will bear the responsibility for the blood that is shed on your hands. Okay, let's do that. <laughs> so lived experience of most of last year before I went to bed every night, I pulled up Microsoft BI and I looked at the stats of the students that were in isolation and quarantine. And every morning I'd look at the stats of the students that were in isolation and quarantine. I checked the security reports. And finally, one day, somebody had to go to the hospital. And I went, oh, here we go. The lived experience of trying to bear the responsibility for the decision, whether to bring people back or not, when both choices would have been okay, was incredibly difficult. Both choices could be justified. The ethical dilemma was we were choosing between two bad options. We had no good options. We did the best we could. And we were incredibly lucky, and people were incredibly committed, but it wasn't easy. And so, even though that's not entirely in the context of how we live the charism in the advancement of the, of the benefit of the community, one thing I will say is there's a lot of respect in the community for the way that we went about it because 
at no time, and this again is to your point, and it's to yours as well, were we doing it in isolation. We were always constantly consulting with other people, trying to figure out what the latest information, who else was doing what, what, what strategy, et cetera, et cetera. Who in the medical community can help us out? That made it not an isolated experience. And that was really important. So when you're faced with challenges that are ethical in nature, don't try to do it alone. That's one of the big takeaways, right? Don't try to do it alone. Try to find other people who you trust, who are smart to consult with and think about, well, what are the ramifications gonna be? Am I thinking about all the things that we need to in the situation? Fortunately, in the academy, we've got a lot of people who are happy to be critical. <laughs> so I'm never at a loss for people who are willing to tell me what they think. That's a good thing. It really is. But we make better decisions when we're willing to listen. Okay, any uh, last questions anyone wants to ask before I ask our panelists to give one final brief bit of advice on how to live out your careers in your life as a noble vocation? <laughs> well, we got a question. Very complicated question, <laughs> um, and it was a crazy time. I mean, it was scary. Um, in fact, about a year later, I stood right here and did a talk to this room about what happened and, and what should we do. Um, but to get to your question, <clears throat> one of the challenges we all face in when there's issues like this, especially broad ones and very public ones is the story is very nuanced in many cases, very complicated in many cases, but the media and people in general want to simplify. And sometimes simplifying it may basically means blame someone, right? Um, my view of the things that went on then is the greater good required a lot of things done that might be distasteful, like bailing people out, right? Because um, they serve a function and a purpose in the economy. And that's the greater good is that things keep working. Um, I think that's the reality. You, you've got, you have to trust that the answer is very complicated and you don't know everything that's going on or went on. Um, there were people who were vilified simply because they were easy targets. Um, did they do things incorrectly or inappropriate? Maybe. Were they criminals? In my view, not necessarily. They were very aggressive businessmen in many cases. Um, but people wanted to blame somebody else. That's that's a big challenge, and that's a lot of what happened in that in that time period. People got blamed, and did they do wrong? Yeah, maybe. But they're not the only ones. That was a group collective total screw up. <laughs> There's a lot of people with their hands in that mess. Um, that answer the question. <laughs> All right, your advice, your succinct advice to them. Uh, try it, try some. Figure out what, and this, this is the advice on a job too. Find something you're passionate about. 
in a, in a career or in a, uh, an endeavor, a charity or some activity. Find something you're passionate about. Uh, try it. You never know. You just don't know. Uh, but look to make impact in your job, in your career, in the community. Make impact. And, and ultimately, that's the fulfilling part, is making an impact. Uh, you know, uh, we often hear or we've heard too much about things like, you know, how these things um, now have more power than almost anything. I mean, you could like launch a nuclear attack, you know, from your phone. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> I say that because when I came to Gonzaga University, this is three generations of technology ago on the phone front, there was a payphone outside my room in Catherine Monica. <laughs> a payphone for the whole floor. Later, we got phones in every room, but they still had like wires connected, right? Uh, eventually, people just stopped even connecting the phones because they were carrying them. Um, <laughs> Analogous to that, I say this to you because I want you to know that part of the work does carry me to places that are difficult and sometimes painful. Each of you who are listening in and being a part of this, you have like way more power than this. You have the power to impact people in ways that you just if you understood it, you'd be like, whoa, I can't, like, I can't touch this. And I say that because I want you to know that another way of putting that is, and this is from, again, the Ignatian tradition, is that if there was a real answer that Ignatius really wanted us to hear, is that somebody needs you. The only thing that you have yet to figure out is who is it. But somebody needs you. And there are people who need, there are people who will benefit from what you already know. They will benefit from what you yet are learning. And they need what you have to offer. And it will change their life too. So don't hold back. You know, there are so many times when we ask so much of our students and they get so much, there's so much pressure. But one of the escape valves can be, to remember that this is all in service to something yet to come. This isn't about today, this is about something else. So part of what I think this time is about is encouraging to again explore, what is that? Where is that? Because it may be many things in the end, but it doesn't have to be big to have an end. And, um, most of the people who got famous doing something, they started doing something that they got recognized for and they didn't even realize it was a thing. So don't let that be the way that you find success. Uh, understand what kind of capability you have and that there are people out there, they need you, they need you. Not just want, they need you. I think that this really builds off of, of what you both said. Um, I think being willing to be uncomfortable and stop and listen is incredibly important. Um, there's a reason our mission statement once said men and women for others and now say men and women for and with others. Um, being a person for others or being people with others so two very different things. Uh, and there, this is where, you know, back to the, the big and small impacts you can have. This is where every day if you listen, you have the opportunity to be with someone, to accompany someone and, and make their and your life a little bit better together uh, and to learn from folks and to learn where the, the skills and talents you have that you maybe aren't even aware of but to learn where those can be of service. Um, 
and I and I think we spend a lot of time uh, thinking about how we can do for others or thinking about how we can solve something, which maybe you can be a part of the solution, and that's fantastic. But it really starts with being willing to pause and listen and center the folks uh, who are struggling. Uh, who are trying to find a better route and who maybe could use your help, um, but they need to be able to lead the way. I would just add this. Um, don't wait for it to happen for you. There are people out there who need you. There are people out there who need you to listen. Go find them. Be an explorer and make use of that passion that you have and your creativity and finding and helping to address and being with those you can serve. That would be my advice. So will you join me in thanking the panel for being here today? I want to thank all of you who in person and everybody who is with us virtually, uh, whether you're at your house or wherever you might be. Thanks for being here today. Peace out. <laughs>